assemble. We, uh, we build communities through makers, artists, learners, and technologists. We instill confidence uh, for big kids like us, and we build better tomorrows with the uh, littler humans, you know. Uh, so, you know, we have a special treat for you today. We have a uh, guest biohacker and artist. Uh, well, I, I won't do the introduction. I will let Dude, you. Dude, I'm not an artist. <laughs> okay, now we're going to definitely call you bio artist. <laughs> the treat is a four loco. So, it's my distinct honor to introduce our speaker, um, the, the, the one and only in the entire universe, our, our hierophant of biohacking, who <laughs> blazed the trail and did just about everything we were all dreaming of long before anybody else was, and started doing things by having the courage to throw caution to the wind. And, and do what needed to be done. And um, without further ado, our own left hand. So the guy said artist earlier. I'm, I'm really not qualified enough to be an artist. Like, I, I, I started off about maybe, maybe 12 to, yeah, around like, like 2006 sort of time. There wasn't really anything like this going on. Uh, nobody that I knew of was using the word biohacker, uh, and uh, the, the new thing at the time was RFID chips, and at the time I was just learning about transhumanism. Uh, just in case anyone was, like transhumanism is just, just a very broad philosophy, which is just using any kind of technology to improve humans' quality of life. I'm all about quality of life for humans, every human. So as soon as I learned about that, I was like, that's cool, and there are all these people talking about it and writing books, and I read a million books. But the, the problem at the time was that none of it was very practical. So the word I came up with was practical transhumanism, which sort of really meant like DIY transhumanism. Uh, just because like there were there were futurists and there were people working in, in cryogenics and there were you know, corporations developing anti-aging and stuff, but it was all very, very, like, a top of society level. It, none of it was accessible to people like us. Like, it, it, it was all, you know, well, you can access this anti-aging medication, this experimental, and it might help you, but it's going to cost a couple hundred dollars per dose, and you need to travel to this center, and you need to know the guy that runs it, or, you know, you can have cryogenics, and it might help you, but it's going to cost... 20,000 pounds or something stupid like that. And I, I just sort of wanted to, I don't know, start a, a kind of like a, like a grassroots sort of movement to do anything, really, that would, that would help people augment themselves to improve their quality of life in any way. Um, at the time, the, the big thing that people were thinking about implant-wise was RFID chips which are like eeny weeny little guys that, I mean, I mean microchips, not guys. <laughs> <laughs> the little tiny, little tiny chips that, that have like a, a passive induction coil and some of them are inside labels, some of them are inside boxes of stuff, some of them are inside, uh, and you know, I, I looked at all of that and I was like, well, that's boring. And then I read a, a, a book by a guy called Amal Grafstra and, and there were lots of cool projects to use these things and right at the back, he said like, oh, and there's these new ones that you can use to track liquids and, and livestock. And they're made of bioglass and like, don't put them in yourself, but at the same time, you know, maybe put them in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought a load of these, these little guys and it said all over them, like, not for animal use, not for human <laughs> use, like only for liquids, only for two weeks use continuous. I'm like, there's, there's a guy, it, it's fine, it's still in there. Like, <laughs> It took me about a, about two weeks probably to psych up enough, because uh, I would have been like 18 at the time, and I, I was very squeamish, and I, I, I bought you know some disposable scalpels. <laughs> and I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> you get over it. Yeah. <laughs> I looked at them and I was like, well, you know, these look really sharp. <laughs> so I thought like, well, okay, okay, we'll, we'll check out some anatomy books, and I studied up for a little bit. And I was like, okay, there's a vein there, don't do that. There's a tendon there, don't do that. Google what happens if I sever a tendon? Like, okay, that's bad, don't do that. Like, and eventually I, I just thought like, okay, we'll, we'll use this little triangle of your hand here, because there's nothing there. Like, it's, it's just skin, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice little blank area. And I, I 
scalpel it open after I'd had a couple of glasses of red wine and, and just thought like, okay, this seems really simple, right? And it, okay, it, it looks really simple when you're first like three or four cuts and then things start bleeding. Oh, God, okay, that's in the way, that's in the way, get up, get up, get up. And then you think like, okay, okay, I made a hole, I made a hole, cool, cool. And so I just put the tag in, right? Like, one, go in. <laughs> so eventually I got this thing in. This was like, this sounds like the worst operation I ever did, but it's totally not. The worst operation was the one after that. <laughs> but like this one was surprisingly successful. And so I rigged up this keyboard that Amal's book taught you how to do. And you, you, you took like an old school beige keyboard and a Windows XP installation. And you do a little bit of code hacking with Gina, which is the, uh, the, the part of Windows that processes password logons. And you tell it, okay, like, I know you normally want a password, but like, what I'm telling you now is that you don't just want a password, you want a password of the unique ID of this tab. So then you get your keyboard and you turn it upside down, you take the bottom off, and you, there's, a, there's a space under the number pad that's pretty much big enough for your average reader for these tags. They don't work at the time, they didn't work with phones, they needed a specific hardware reader. And you, you mount the reader inside the, the keyboard, seal it back up, plug it into, you, into your computer, turn it back on, and then without much work, you had a keyboard that wouldn't work unless your hand was physically present. And like, yes, there are massive security holes in this, as I'm sure pretty much everyone can notice, because these are, any reader can read them. You know, any, anyone can bump you with a reader and be like, oh, okay, now I have that thing that's the key to your whole computer. But coupled with the password, at the time it was reasonably secure and pretty cool. And, and, and that just kind of set me off on like a path of like, well, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> what else can we do? <laughs> so I, I started Googling for, you know, small scale implants. At the time, I didn't really want to do anything uh, like you know physically huge because I didn't really have the, the surgical expertise. And I, I, I'm a lot, a lot of the people that I work with are like impressively good at electronics, but I am not. I have fried things. I have blown up things. I have melted things. Like I've fused things together. So I thought like right, it's, it's got to be like you know very very mechanically simple and very easy to disseminate the knowledge and at the time um, like serendipitously what had more or less just been invented by a guy called Steve Hayworth in the US was these these little magnets only about um they're about a millimeter they're, they're basically comparable in size to the like the uh, the end of an eraser on a pencil only very flat and uh, this guy had just invented them and he was like oh they're really cool you know you, like you you have to get them into your fingertip which is the hard part but once they're there like they, you know, even the mechanism wasn't known at the time, but they, they sort of, whenever you're in the presence of an, uh, any electromagnetic field, they, they make your fingers fizz. So you've got like a sense of, of where these, these fields are and how strong they are and the shape of them. And obviously, a little bit pointless, don't really need it for anything, not gonna help you survive in the wilderness after the apocalypse, but, but pretty cool. I thought, yeah, like, yeah, like, hey, let's do that. Because like, they, were, they were stupidly expensive at the time. You, you had to pay about, I uh, convert that into dollars, about um, $70 per magnet. And then you had to pay for shipping because they, weren't, they were only made by Hayworth in the States. And so I thought, like, like okay, well, we'll use some student loan money, which really should have been better used for food. But you know, we'll import like a box of these. And, like, I'm going to put a whole set of them in. <laughs> this is the operation that went badly wrong. And I, I didn't know anything about sterile procedure. I didn't know anything about, you know, like how to keep germs off of your equipment. I, I thought, like, all right, well, as long as you wash everything, and as long as I'm in the bathroom, and there aren't many germs in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I set up everything in the bathroom on, like, a, like a plastic table. And I, I didn't, I, I, had, I had a scalpel, like a disposable scalpel, and like, I thought, okay, right, simplistic idea. Cut a hole in your finger, shove the magnet in, bind it all up, it'll heal up, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> That's not what happened. Like, like, first of all, it turned out that the, it's very, very difficult to actually, if you're not used to doing it, cutting yourself open with a scalpel is very difficult. And the more nerve dense the area, the more 
hard it is to, I thought like, oh, you just push past the pain. Like, that's next to impossible in one of the most nerve dense areas in your body. So like, I, I sort of spent like a, a long time going, <laughs> oh, that hurts. Uh, eventually I got a hole and the hole wasn't big enough, so I had to go back, make it up some more. And then there was like the blood and I had to rinse that off. And then the sink filled with blood and I had to empty that. And it, it, eventually I've got a hole. Okay, good, good. We've been here for like an hour. You thought this operation was going to take five minutes. Like, okay, right, now, now get the magnet in. It won't go in. It, okay, well, I can't make the hole any bigger because like there's already shitloads of blood and I'm worried about, you know, like there's, there, there, are, there are loops of vein inside here, so if you hit the middle, you're all right, but if you hit the edge, like it'll bleed even more. And I thought, well, okay, so the reason it won't go in is because the hole won't stay open more enough. So like what will hold the, the hole open what would a surgeon use? A retractor. What's shaped like a retractor that's in my house? Potato peeler. Like, oh. <laughs> the end of the potato peeler. <laughs> so I stopped for a bit and I, I like surgical spirit in the end of the potato peeler. Not the blady bit, just the just the little like the, the little U-shaped bit on the end of it. And it'll like eventually I figured out like like if you get it in there and then you turn it 90 degrees and it'll like open it up like that. And then you can slide the magnet along the, the potato peeler, I mean the, the retractor, <laughs> and, it, and I thought like, okay, well now it's in, like, okay, so you bandage it up, and like, way over bandaged it, and, and then like, oh shit, my dad's coming to pick me up tomorrow for like a two day road trip, okay, think about that, pack your stuff, like go down, so I didn't look at it for three days, <laughs> occasionally on the road trip, like, while I was, you know, eating or something, or looking out the window of the car, occasionally, like, something in the back of my head would go, hmm, feels a bit hot, mm. Mm. seems to be throbbing a little bit, <laughs> but I didn't know that was bad at the time, I thought, like, oh, it just means it's healing. <laughs> oh my God. So when I got to my mom's house, I thought, ah, well, it's been bandaged up for a little bit, better have a look at it. Like, so, so I opened it all up and I took the bandage off and like first a shitload of pus came out and I was like, oh well, that's not good. <laughs> and I looked and like the magnet was here, all down here, like my, pretty much my entire hand was red. You could see all the veins and like there was a green line that went all the way down here. <laughs> my mum used to be a nurse. And obviously she looked at it and the first thing she, well, the first thing she said was, <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> and I just started talking about sepsis and bacteria and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, we're not going to the hospital. It's fine. And she said, okay, well, at least let me, like, you know, give it a squeeze and, and you know, figure out, like, how much goo is in there. And she didn't even squeeze it that hard. And she sort of, like, took it and went like that, like, squeeze either side. And this bloody... $70 magnet that I only had five of when bounced off the sofa, bounced off the floor, down a hole in the floorboards, never to be seen again. <laughs> Worst operation in my life. Like the, the reason I'm telling you guys about this is because once everything has gone that badly wrong, you can tell everyone and then it will never go that badly wrong for you again, nor will it ever do that for anyone else. So, like, I do dumb things so you don't have to. <laughs> but it, eventually, after a lot of trial and error, I, I, I figured out that there's actually, a, like, it doesn't sound like this should be true, but it really is. Like, a lot of things that you'll want to do as a biohacker, you'll see, you know, people have cool chips, they'll have, like, interesting stuff, and they'll have a, an interesting device, and especially the magnets and the chips, which are the most common things that people want to do. Both of these are tiny little devices, and actually, all you need is, is a very simple procedure for either one of them. So, like, I, I figured I'd just, you know, tell you guys, like, one and the other, just in case anyone was, was like, like, for the magnets, Obviously, the, the, the hardest thing right now is getting a hold of them. Um, the best place to get them used to be a guy called Amal Grafstra who was making them, but he's running into manufacturing difficulties at the moment. I'm not sure what exactly is up, but once you have this guy, you need um, any surface. I've even done it on like wooden coffee tables and stuff. And everything you need you can pretty much get from a medical supply house. So the first thing you, you get loads of household bleach and you scrub everything you can. All the room, everywhere. 
preferably in a room with a hard floor and not a carpeted floor because they carry lots of germs, but you scrub fuck out of your surface and you get on a medical supply house and you say like, oh, can I buy some sterile fields? Little fold out, um, they come in a, in a sterile pouch and they're like, um, when you see on TV those green cloths that surgeons use for everything, like that's what those guys are. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're single use, little sterile, like lay down stuff. So you lay that out on the surface and you peg it down with stuff and then you can put all your tools on there. And as long as you're using single use disposable stuff, for the magnet, all you'll need is your magnet, which should come in a little like a sterile package. You'll need a, what they call an eight gauge needle, which is a, a five millimeter, huge, big, nasty ass looking piercer needle. And some steri strips to close the wound. And that's it. And all you do is you, you lay your finger, if you're gonna do it on this finger, you, you lay your finger laterally on the side so that it's like facing sideways up. And you get you put it you write a little dot with a biro where you're gonna want the needle to go in. And you, you want somebody to help, like um somebody wearing sterile gloves obviously to, to like stabilize the needle. And you, you just like you need a lot of body weight, but you like stand up, you just lean all your body weight into it, and it'll go jump, jump, and it'll punch a hole normally about half the way through in. Like People say, oh, well, if you leave all your weight, if you lean all your weight into it, you'll punch a hole all the way through. But as far as I can tell, the, uh, what's under the skin, there's a layer called the fascia of like connective tissue. And that's so strong and hard to punch through that I've never managed to go all the way through. So like after you've leaned all the way into this thing, you take your needle out, then you made a good big hole, and then you just shove the magnet straight in before everything starts to bleed. And then you wrap it up. And then like, as long as you clean it every day, within a day, it'll be sealed up. Within a week, it'll be mostly healed. And within like a week minimum, two weeks maximum, it'll be working as a sensory organ. Like it's so simple. I mean, obviously it took a long time to go through enough iterations of like, well, that didn't work. Like that worked, but it's not so great. You know, that, that worked, but it could be made easier. But like this, this is a fairly refined process at this point. And it, pretty much anyone can do it. As long as you can get hold of the magnet, that's a difficult part at this time. But like it, it's it's what most people want to do first. It's what they hear about as like a really simplistic but cool biohacker thing, and it, it's 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 like really easy. Same with the RFID chips. Like all you got to do is um, if you buy them from Amal, it's even easier because he makes them in in ready little um. Have you any of you ever had your pet's microchips? And you know you, you, they've got like a little um syringe looking doohickey, and all they do is pick up a bit of the pet's skin and go yeep yeep, it's done. Like Amal makes those for people. And it tells us that like the back of your hand, which is where most people want them, like this is super elastic. So you can fit loads of crap under there. <laughs> like never mind something as tiny as a microchip. And you can do it with one of those. Or if you've got the chip separately, you just buy a, a, a small gauge 4G piercers needle, make holes, shove it in, pull it back. Like certain things that if you were using other places, you'd need to carve pockets, protect, fit in. But with the back of the hand or the fingertips, you you don't need to, because it's so elastic that you know you can just slide stuff in under the skin. So like that, like those two things are what most people sort of start out doing. And at this point, they're they're really simple. Like you don't need any skills. You don't really need very much money. Like you can, you know, if if you want fifty chips, you can do yourself fifty chips. Like I know a guy in Holland that's got what has he got thirty seven or something stupid man. Every kind, every variation uses them to unlock his house and his safe and his motorbike and start his car and like you can do some really cool things with them and they're so simplistic to put in like obviously as your tech gets bigger then you're running into bigger problems like the, this guy here this is a, a, a yeah i know right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's still a better reaction than my mom had <laughs> what have you done <laughs> She wasn't very happy, but like the bigger your thing is, the more you run into problems. Like you, and and the main problem is that you can't just cut a hole and put stuff in. Much as I've tried, like maybe I think if you were strong enough and your tech was robust enough, you could just fucking shove it in there. But you, you maybe don't try that. <laughs> you, you could like like you, you, mostly you need to you need to make a, a little incision or a big incision in this case, and then like get a scalpel in there and carve out like space for it to go around. And 
for this you're going to need a little bit more surgical skill, you're going to need some lidocaine because like, I, I had that done and that really hurt even with lidocaine. You know, the, the dude who does it is like, oh hey, are you alright man? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, but you're crying though. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe a bit more drugs then. So like, <coughs> bigger stuff, I, I generally tell people like, like, you know, stay away from unless you're really used to, you know, tattoo piercing type stuff and you've had a lot of like, decorative silicon implants and stuff already, but the small stuff is super easy and, and anyone can do it and there are, there are medical supply houses, from what I can tell, in every state and every country and they don't, they don't check if you're a doctor, they don't even check if you're a piercer. Like, you can say, oh yeah, I'd like shitloads of scalpels and needle blades and sterile fields and surgical gloves and I've even bought like legit surgical gear. Like, you know, scopes and retractors and, and, and like, like, everything. And they'll just, they'll just Amazon that shit to you. <laughs> you can buy nearly anything that you need. And, and like I said, for the simplest stuff, you, you need the simplest, it, it's, it's mostly just a needle. Stuff heals incredibly quickly. I mean, even me, like I smoke like a chimney and I drink and I'm not the healthiest person, so I, I, stuff shouldn't heal very quickly. But, you know, these tiny holes, they seal up by the next day. And you don't even get real scars or anything. So like, now you guys know how to put in like small things if, if you particularly wanted to. Um, that's mostly what I tell everyone every time. But I wondered if, like, like, is there anything any, that people specifically wanted to know about before I go off on random tangents about the peg leg and stuff? You refer to the magnets as a sensory organ. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that sensation? Oh yeah, it's. I found that the best way to describe it is like when a field is present and your hand is close enough to, to actually feel the field. It's like <coughs> if you if you pour out a glass of soda and then you put your hand in the glass, mm. like that sort of like fizzing kind of feeling, like it, it generates enough <coughs> tiny electricity charge to set off the nerve endings, but not enough for it ever to like hurt. Mm. Like even if you get really close to a really strong field, all you'll get is like a really strong fizzing, tingling sensation. Some people don't like it to start off with. And I, in fact, the, the, the thing that I found that most people really don't like that you kind of get used to after a while, it's not the sensation of them while they're in use, but the sensation of like pressing on them and moving things around, like other people don't like feeling it either. You know, people will say, "Oh, can I touch it?" And he's like, "Yeah, okay." And they'll go, "Oh, can I move it around?" And you go, "Yeah, okay." And then they do, and they're like, "Ugh!" <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, that's pretty much what it's like. Like, can you war drive with it? Like, could you, a naive example, <laughs> find a bug? Like, if something was bugged and it was emitting. If it was emitting a field, then yes, you could. Yeah, I found that it, it's not a long range sense. So like, say the bug was in the corner of your room. Yeah, no. You'd have to go to the corner of the room, but like, you, you wouldn't be able to feel it from like here over there. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the, I'm not sure if this is because of the size of the magnets or what, um, but it seems like even with a strong field, the longest distance that they have is something like, like maybe a meter, like, like, you know, like yay far, but like, Stuff like a microwave gives off a massive field. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure even even if a bug was giving off a little field, if you went onto your light switch and it's making a funny field, you could be like, that's not normal. I'm going to take that open and look inside <laughs> it. Like, because it's a short range sense, you might have to look all over the room first. But yeah. eventually, just, yeah. Just pet everything. <laughs> maybe if you like, maybe if yes. you all got one, then you like collectively. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, when, when you're looking at stuff, <laughs> Looking, you're not looking, you're sensing, whatever. It, I, I forget that it's weird. So, like, you know, interesting plugs will give off interesting fields, but you see, oh, cool, it's like torus shaped and there's a stronger bit in the middle, and this is from here, and there must be in the device over here, and what everyone else sees is you this. I'm guessing it, like, Probably to most people, I just look like I'm high off my gourd. But you know, if you're okay with that, then yeah, you totally could. <laughs> I figured if, if there's not like a, a super load of questions, I tell you guys about the peg leg. Yeah. Mm, we, we call it the peg leg because, um, but like story time. And we we're at Grindfest, which is like a, a, a collection of, of grinders and hackers and stuff from all over the world, and it's all a, a Cassock's place. Cassock's is a great dude, super skilled. 
like way more impressive than me. Really should be listening to him. But it's at his place, and he's got this massive lab and stuff. And we're all just hanging out, and I'm eating like my fifth bowl of Lucky Charms. And Michael shows up, and he's like, "Hey guys, I got this little little white box, little device." I'm like, "What's that, man?" It's like it's a pirate box. Gives off a Wi-Fi signal, and I'm like, "You connect it. You connect your phone to its Wi-Fi signal." And, and then like it's got like anonymous chat and, and it's got all of these like 64 gig of files on it, all kinds of like, you know, interesting music and banned books and like movies and stuff and all this data that you can store on it. You can put anything you like on it, we can swap data, everyone can upload to it. I was, you know, like your mouth says, yeah man, that's cool. And your brain says, that looks like it'd fit in my arm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's somewhere like it was pretty obvious that, you know, I, I can't remember which one of us first said, I wonder if we could put this sucker in someone. And it was you. <laughs> and like, obviously, when we say someone, we mean like, whoever's dumb enough to let you do it. <laughs> Just obviously me, because that's my entire thing in this community is that, you know, they say, ah, oh, I don't know if this coating might work, it might be biocompatible, it might be not. I'm like, let's find out. <laughs> Come on, plenty of room, like loads of space in here, let's do it. So like, these guys are all much more skilled electronically than I am. So like they took the housing off and they took out like sanded the corners down so it wouldn't be cornery. I know it looks like it has really sharp corners, but it, like it totally doesn't. They're all they're all rounded off. And they, they, they sort of like I'm not I'm not completely okay with what exactly was done, that's more your thing. But you know, got rid of anything that was redundant or unnecessary, it took out the battery, so because this guy's a prototype, it charges by one of those wireless um chi charging coils. So like you, you put the chi pad next to it. And then it's like, oh yeah, I can see another coil. Like, oh cool, so I'll boot myself up. And in fact, as you can see it booting up, it links LEDs through the skin. Which is like, it's completely wicked. But, <laughs> but once it's booted itself up, it gives off a wireless signal right through your skin for, for quite a long way. And it, the, the idea is like that they're, the, the ones that they've made now, uh, the ones that they're working on, you'll have to hold it there for a while, man. Yeah, sorry. Are, um, Oh, like like a core of the size. They're they're getting super tiny and super thin. Mm. So like, whereas this guy wouldn't be so great for data couriering because it's not very uh, unobtrusive. Yeah. <laughs> like it's really obvious. Like you, like you go through like TSA and they're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you gotta grab the other one. Yeah, go for it. But uh, you know, prototype and and the ones that are actually properly being worked on are really unobtrusive. You know, you can have them in your thigh and especially if you put them in somewhere where there's not very much, out of, like where there's a lot of adipose tissue to, you know, cushion this thing. Like, it, it, it looks like it should be, um, like obviously this, this looks like it should be like painful, but it's not, it's just weird, the vascular healing. And you know, it, it, it looks like it should be like really delicate, but you can whack it around it, like it's completely fine. It's, it's really robust. How long ago did you get, uh, did you do that? This guy was put in at Brownfest, which was in May? Yeah. Like April. In April. In April. Yeah. So like it, it, it took a while to heal up. Obviously, a bigger thing takes longer to heal up, but like still healed pretty quickly. And it, in general, you know, things like that, they don't tend to move because they they sort of heal scar tissue around them, so that it like holds it in place. And I mean, like, it's gonna be a bitch to take it back out if I ever need to. But. You look concerned, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's accurate. If I, just, if I just learned about this and it wasn't me, I'd probably be concerned too. <laughs> this, this is why I do this and, and you know, rather than other people, because I don't actually care what happens to me. Like, I, I care if it goes into my friends and it messes them up, for, but like, I'll, I'll test anything. I don't, I don't mind, I don't mind if you, even if you coat it in vodka, I don't, I don't, I don't care, I'll test that. <laughs> this guy healed up eventually, and you know, it's, it's, it's still working, it hasn't had any, um, it, there, there was a lot of problem with fluid buildup, so it had like a big balloon over the top of it for a while. And I was like, mm, are we going to stick a big needle in that and drain all that out? And eventually I decided like, no, less needles is better needles. But, uh, are we still trying? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the, the point is that the actual working, like proper, non-prototype versions of these guys are super sleek, super unobtrusive, straight out of Johnny Mnemonic. 
you know, you can go onto the airport and then you can slip the cheap pad charger into your pocket and suddenly everyone's like, where did this wireless signal come from? <laughs> oh, hey, look, look, all these free movies. Who is doing this? <laughs> Yeah, this is the this is the, the the guy that they're working on right now. And you can see it's like oh, like it's been shrunk, but it's like a third of the size, yeah, and like super thin as well. So the I'm 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 not certain of this because I haven't done any like specific quantified experiments, but I'm reasonably sure that this is about as big as you can get something without the tissue on top dying because it needs like access to the vascular system underneath. So like, the smaller you can make something about it, but everything shrinks in prototyping after a while. But yeah, I, I'm totally like, I, I was really pleased with this guy. <laughs> what files are you happiest to have on your body? What? What files are you happiest to have in your body? Illegal ones. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have your coil? It's like, uh, this, this is the best. little one that works I so do not have my yeah, coil right, with I'll, me. I'll keep messing with it. I mean, you can if you want, man. <laughs> The, 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 the problem with this guy is that you need to you need to hold the the pad like pretty close to it, so it needs to stay there for a while. And obviously, like I gesticulate like a motherfucker, so it's gonna be really difficult for him to hold it. You're there. like you get one of those like iPod holders that clip yeah. to your yeah. arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The only thing is like the modern ones assume like a really small, sleek iPad. I was trying to like jam the cheap pad charger in there, and it, it wouldn't work. So what I need is one of the really old school ones. You remember like those iPads that have like a hard drive inside? <laughs> <laughs> this is what they had to do while they put it in. Um, just to be clear about how it works then, it doesn't really transmit or do anything until it's near the until charger. Until the cheap has there, So yeah. it's, unless you can see it visually, it's like, it's not like there could be a signal to detect it, right? Yeah, while, okay. while it's, um, assuming that it was a small one and that it was hidden in like, when I upgrade this, I'm going to put it in my thigh. Because I got a lot of room in this big old thighs. You know, there's a lot of room for devices in here. I make a nice deep pocket, shove it right the fuck in there. Seems to work very well through flash. Like, doesn't seem to impede the signal very much at all, which you think it would. And it, pretty much no one can tell it's there unless the inductive charge is there. That's awesome. So you, you can share data when you want, and as soon as somebody says, like, oh, where's that signal coming from? You can be like, nowhere. <laughs> So anybody who wants to pull their phone out and search for Wi-Fi signals? Uh, it may not have spun up very quickly. Yeah. All right. it, it may you take another minute. You but it's a lot. By the end of the talk, you should be able to see. Yeah. Uh, there'll, there'll be a thing that says Pirate Box Share Freely, assuming mm -hmm. I can continue to hold this in place. Assuming you can sit there the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the first time you see it working, you're like, Oh my God, that's coming from inside somebody. Ah. <laughs> Initially, people thought a lot about data couriering with like the, the tiny RFID chips, but the fact is they hold like 20 fucking bits of information, like yeah. basically nothing. So that they're fine for transport with like your PGP key or something. Mm -hmm. And there's one that they were selling at Body Hacks called the Vivo Key Spark that's just come out. That's like kind of on the borderland between like um, corporate sold stuff and, and hacker developed stuff. It, it's like, you don't really need to trust because it's all, bit, it's all, um, blockchain stuff, so you don't really need to be trusting a corporate with your data or anything, but it can hold like your PGP key or something. And then you don't need to have it anywhere else, because your phone can interact with it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are probably some security holes in here somewhere. But, like, that that was where data couriering was at the time. But, but like, this guy, this is great, because you can keep all the data straight on there. And, like, this guy has a, a 64 gigabyte USB, because that's what was there because we had like a week to make it. We made it in and, 50 hours. And yeah. <laughs> it wasn't and, like, a week. <laughs> it was only with like everything that was there to begin with and some stuff that we could get Amazon to send there. So it's like, well, if it can't get to Tetra Happy within, you know, a couple of days, then you can't have it. So we use this USB stick. But like you can stick like a couple of terabytes on there. You can keep all your private files on there. You can encrypt stuff. You can, you can, like, it's straight out of Johnny in the morning, man. It's great. <laughs> I don't know if mine's strong enough to power this. It might be dropping out. It's, it's, the blue light's on, so it suggests, but I don't see, I don't see your LED button. Yeah, if mine's not blinking, then it's that uh, bummer. Oh, well. Okay. 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 Well, the light. You guys can see the, so this is the, this yeah, is if, the if blue Yeah, if you want to, like, demo that guy spinning Right, on. and so you guys can sort of see it spin up. This, this demo prototype doesn't always work. 
If it doesn't work, but I'll spin up the one in my leg, which does seem to work. There it goes. There it goes. Obviously, the first time you see something glicking up through your skin, you're like, hey, it's booting! Look at it go! <laughs> Is this, yeah, so that little green light I saw for the first time through my skin like this morning before the sun rose. Cyber last night we're hanging out and I was like, I never looked to see if I can actually see the light. I was like, oh, this is blinking! <laughs> so there's a second, so yeah, when the blue LED comes on you should be able to find the, the network. And this, right, one will say, this one will say peg leg. I'm sorry, what, what were you asking? Yep. Um, so... Can you can you run software? So like my friend, some of my friends make these gossip protocols, and it's pretty easy to make them uh, what they call promiscuous, which is basically any time they come into contact with another signal emitting that code, they'll trade they'll gossip with each other and trade information. Can you run any type of software like that? That would be him to answer that question because I'm not quite sure about the specific. So the blue LED you right? see is not part of the original board. That's a piggyback board. That's a second Wi-Fi card that allows it to mesh with cool. other peg legs. Oh, then you could build sneaker nets and mesh. This nets was the coolest thing about it. Yeah, the fact yeah. that if you get a load of us and we all get them, then we're a human peer-to-peer -peer mesh network. <laughs> 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 When they say that, <laughs> for the people, all of the people, like, that's what we mean. Yeah, you should put scuttlebutt on these. Let's chat. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was the hardest part of the building up version two. Yeah, was the meshing. Which is his problem, not mine. <laughs> In terms of like the physical longevity of like the the implants, mm -hmm. um, depending on like I guess the size, obviously, but what's on or in the PCB? Are there any kind of like long term? Is there anything biochemically happening with the tissue that's like, in your body interacting with on there that would cause problems? Like I'd say at the least. Probably rendering like the like you know the PCB like non-functional or I guess physical like experience. Like. I, I would be like ninety-nine percent no because the the coating that we're using on this is developed by I I, I don't know whether I should be saying who it is because I don't want to like potentially get him in trouble but whoever yeah. he's a genius and dude has this like custom resin coating that he's tested to infinity and beyond and it it seems to be pretty much bulletproof. Yeah, like, it's really impressive. Like it's it's very very well done, and I I'm glad I didn't have to engineer it myself because I, <coughs> he uses some um, beautifully engineered uh, test stress tested to infinity uh, a custom resin coating, and I use hot glue so <laughs> hot glue is great too. But like this stuff is is great, and like I, obviously you know we can't be like a hundred percent certain that nothing would happen. But I, I'm certain enough that I would trust almost anything no matter the size with this coating. And also like because it because generally things are very close to the surface, be a bit more of a problem like under your leg. But like again to Yeah, but like if something's very close to the surface, all you gotta do is make an incision along the longest side and like shoot that shit straight out. And if it, if it's deeper down, you just make like a little incision there and a T incision there, and you open it up and you pull it out. I mean it, even stuff that went like uh, this is some the only, back in the day I, w I was trying to work with like um, my own custom coatings for these magnets because the, the coated ones were even more expensive and uh, this one was a custom coating that I did not test adequately and it failed and when, when neodymium, which the magnets are made of, comes in contact with the inside of your, your biochemistry, it, it all like uh, rusts, your body realizes it's rusting and it goes, oh shit! Oh, uh, reject it! Oh, I can't reject it! It's it's in too deep! Oh, fuck! Oh, just 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 cover it in scar tissue and leave it there, ma'am! So there was this gigantic lump of scar tissue that failed. I used to call it the giant finger. I, I used to use it as a warning to people, like, don't test your own coatings without putting them sufficiently through rigorous testing or this will happen. But, like, even when we took that out, like, there, there was a lot of, you know, rusted, encapsulated stuff. And it was pretty gross, and it was unsightly. But even that hadn't affected like my system as a whole. It, it just it just looked bad. So like, if you were if you wanted to be like a hundred percent certain that nothing would happen, I would say give it another you know couple of years until you can see that people like us have had it in for a long time and nothing's happened. Mm -hmm. But if you were using that coating, I would be pretty close to certain that nothing's going to happen. 
Um, I guess my follow-up question with that, whether or not like you know it's in, what does going through TSA look like for you? Uh, I, I put on my shit in the scanner and it all goes through the x-ray and they say, why have you got all these controlled drugs? And I'm like, well, they're prescribed. And then that goes through. And then I walk through the scanner. And before I walk through it, I say, my implant, I'll set it off. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they think they're thinking like tiny, teeny implant. And I walk through it and bleep, 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 bleep. And they put me in the body scanner and I say, it's in here. And they go, okay, so I'm gonna do this stupid thing for a little bit. And I walk through there and I bleep, 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 bleep. Oh yeah, you weren't kidding, it's in there. And I thought at that point, right, they're gonna like, take you into a back room and feed you through a person side x-ray scanner and drug dogs are gonna sniff you and they're gonna like wanna get a surgeon to scalpel it out and look at it and stuff and they're gonna be afraid it's a bomb and they're gonna deny you access into the country. No, they don't care. <laughs> they seriously do not care. Like I was totally worried about nothing for no reason. Dude just puts me through the body scanner and says, oh yeah, it is where you say it is. And they just assume it's like an insulin device or something. Uh, they've done more to me for no yeah, reason. Yeah, they don't give a fuck. <laughs> I know, right? That's a pretty big security hole. Like, what if it was a bomb, dude? <laughs> they tested my fingers for residue at the airport recently when I went to Canada, but I don't know why it happened. Maybe I was just acting weird that day. Last time I went through on, on my way down here, they tested my prescription bottles of morphine for residue. <laughs> well, what do you think's gonna be on them, dude? <laughs> they didn't tell me what residue they're testing for, so I still have no idea if it was like bombs or drugs. So, so like, I can't become a ghost here, I'm coated in cocaine. Like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, not professional. This is why I don't do talks very <laughs> I'm sorry, did anyone have anything like legitimate questions? Well, I just wanted to say to the people that did log on to the device, if you crack open your browser and go to piratebox.land the backslash, that's how you interact with it. Yeah, yeah it's piratebox.land slash. Yeah. And I've, I've been writing piratebox.land on like documentation and stuff, and I really need to change that. Yeah. Um, if you have an Android, it'll say tap here to log in, and the splash screen should come up. It should look something like this. So, yeah. And say hi in the chat. It's got an enormous Sign tap room. room. It's got an image board. <laughs> I did kind of want to ask about an earlier project you had. Um, you tried a thermistor at one point, and that's super cool because it's one of the only other sensory augmentation projects that anyone's tried to my knowledge. So even though I know that it, in the end, didn't go so great, I'd love to hear the story of that if you want to share. This was like, for a while, um, I was on enough meds that I couldn't reliably tell what temperature it was around outside. So I used to walk out and, and like walk through Scotland in the winter for like a couple of miles and be like, ah fuck, meat's covered in goosebumps, probably pretty cold out here, oh, I better put a jumper on. Like, and this was dumb. Like, so <laughs> for a while I was like, wait, no, 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 we can technologically fix this. We can technologically fix this thing. <laughs> like, only instead of developing like a complex enclosed implant, because I'm actually fairly chromagnon compared to most people, I was like, well, I don't know much about electronics, but I know enough to get like a thermistor and a battery and like an LED. And it, it was like, all you do is you connect these guys up with just plain solder. And all that happens is like, the hotter it is, the brighter the LED glows. Like without you having to do anything. So I, I had the whole thing like embedded. It's, it's this scar here, it was in the back of my wrist. And it, it worked like a dream for quite a while. And, and the coating was fine, even though the coating was only hot glue out of the glue gun. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, surprisingly, it actually worked really well. And it was actually fairly useful. Like, art, oh, really dull, you know, nice and warm in here. Time to go to sleep. Art, oh, really bright, time for a sweater. And, and it keeps on, like, obviously, implants, as far as normal people are concerned. Some people think they're cool. Some people think they're super gross. Implants with LEDs. Oh, cyberpunk as fuck! <laughs> cool. like, and, and this guy was great until its battery ran flat, and then I was like, oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I had a lot of LED ones as well, where, like, I, I, I guess, like, what, what makes me a particular in, in this is that I don't really give a fuck what happens to any of this meat. So like if stuff needs to come out with a scalpel, it comes out with a scalpel. I don't really care. You know, like you should see how much blood stains there are in my house. 
But like these these guys, I was like, okay, so we get some LEDs and we sold them. You know, you can make LED throwies that you throw around and stick on lampshades and stuff. Like yeah. same deal. You you make a bunch of throwies and you encapsulate them in, in your coating, or whatever. And then you just put it wherever, man. And then they glow for like like a couple of months and then they stop glowing. You're like, ah, oh, bummer. Time to take them all out. Like. But for a couple of parties, you know, you look really cool. Like, eventually, I kind of, I, I was thinking like, okay, we can't be doing this forever because, you know, like I'm pretty covered in scar tissue at this point, and eventually we're gonna run out of places to put things. So like, you know, gotta come up with a a, a rechargeable like, battery problem, and like I've tried a lot of power solutions over the time. Like I, I I've tried like um like dynamos out of watches so that as you move around it will charge up the things. I've tried like inductive coils, I've tried, you know, like long life batteries, batteries are supposed to charge wirelessly and again the whole problem here is that I am like the opposite of an electrical engineer. Like, like I have like a negative experience with this stuff so, but then I get to these guys and they're just like, yeah, two coils, no problem, do it. So pretty much now you don't even need to worry about batteries and thermistors and stuff. And in fact, I believe there is actually now a commercial temperature sensing in the plant, but the guy doesn't do it all the time. Got to stop referring to inanimate objects as guys. Like they're, they're not little guys; they're devices. But the device doesn't work all the time. It's like an NFC that tells you the temperature when you ping it to your <laughs> phone or something. So, so like, yeah, they do exist, but they're not as cool as mine. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did anyone? Did anyone else have anything like a? Well, you kind of answered it, but I was saying, do you think there'll ever be technology developed that can somehow be powered off the human body inherently? I wouldn't like be something surprised. Something biochemically, maybe? Like, a lot of people have asked me that over the time, and I remember having a fair few conversations with a biology professor about it, and, like, again, kind of a dumbass, so I tend to ask them, like, you know that song that goes, if you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough, like, that's me. <laughs> so I asked this guy, and I was like, Something, something, electricity in your blood. Something, something, electricity in your nerves. Something, something, couldn't you use this for electronics? And he was like, no, dumbass. Like, it's not enough electricity. Don't be stupid. It's like orders of magnitude bigger than you'd need. But, I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised in the future if there was. If they're really energy efficient tech in the future, then maybe. Yeah. It, it seems like, like, from what they were saying, like, he didn't even say, like, oh, it's like 10 years away. He was just like, like, no. You know, as we stand right now, not, not gonna happen. But I, I, I'm loath to tell anyone like, oh no, that'll never happen. You know, I feel like like when people, when Nikola Tesla was like, oh hey, you know, here's these two coils and like electricity jumps between them and we could use that for wireless charging, and they were all like, shut up, Tesla, that's stupid. That will never catch on. Like, like but nowadays, like that's exactly the principle that we're using for this stuff. Um, I'm sorry, there should have been a short, concise answer for that. I apologize. Yeah, that's great. If, if, if that's everyone, I think. So like with the peg leg, um, right now the way it works is you put up the uh, the charging battery thing mm -hmm. and then it turns on, right? Yeah. Is there, is it, would it be viable, especially on the smaller version, to have it so that like you can, you can charge it when you need to charge it, but like independently you can turn it on a if little less If you have a conspicuous. battery on it, then mm -hmm. yes. And when I was talking to the guys, I suggested leaving the battery on, and the thing that made them take the battery out was that they were concerned that the heat expansion of the yeah. battery eventually over time would like cause stress in the resin and possibly cause like mm -hmm. tiny cracks and stuff. So I think if you if you had a very good flexible coating, which again just saying hot glue, but <laughs> <laughs> seriously man, out of all the like custom coatings and shit I've tried and like you know, like moldable silicone and expensive shit, like all, all the homebrew shit. Fucking hot glue, it's good shit, man. <laughs> but you know, if, if you could find like a medical grade mm -hmm. flexible coating with a battery in, I, I'm not sure, like, do batteries die after a while, even if you're a child yeah, and yeah, you're yeah, charging them? Good. Yeah. Or, or we've also been looking into certain supercapacitor uh, <coughs> solutions. A lot of wearables have these like thin film supercapacitors that are pretty dope. Um, and if you have enough of them, they'll let it run for a while. Originally we were doing it as just like an emergency shutdown thing, so it's like if you take the battery away, it will signal it to shut down properly. Uh, 
we made it more robust than that, so you can just kind of power and it'll, it'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, but for version three, we're continuing to talk about power sources as a possible thing. The the cool part again is that the wearing out bit, right? Yeah. It's like if you don't have a battery, then the lifetime of your electronics is relatively indefinite. This stuff is going to be here forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. And the great thing about all of this is that before I ever got into all the, the like, before I got into the, all the biohacking stuff, I was really into cyberpunk as a kid because I, I was born in '88 and I grew up in the '90s and like that's like the heyday of cyberpunk, you know. Like I grew up like reading William Gibson and stuff, and like the the kind of the, the whole thing about like cyberpunk is that in all of these imagined societies, there's a duality where you've got like expensive ass sleek chrome shiny tech for the people who make money not like us and then for all of us like there's our shit like all the homebrew shit and like i guess it should have been kind of depressing like oh by the way you know, like you're working class as fuck so like you're never going to afford super fancy fast running prosthetic legs but you could build some yeah. uh, so it, it was sort of like a like a you know even if you're poor even if you're not like a a, a super genius, like you can come together as a community and you can pool your resources and your talent and your skills and you can come up with some really cool fucking shit. And, like, that's pretty much the whole thing about transhumanism for me. <laughs> what do you think it would look like turning the actual, like if, if you did get, you know, um, a self powered sort of like a, a peg leg in, mm -hmm. what would it look like to turn it on? Would you have like a thing on your phone that can turn it on? Would it be like physical thing or like a remote that you awkwardly carry around? No, I, I'd probably like like one or two different methods. Like it would be, I think ideally it would be pretty handy to be like, like on the one hand I can signal it via my phone mm -hmm. and on the other hand if my phone's gone or I'm in like an, an airplane or something I can just like, yeah right, and, it, and it'll just like spin itself up. Like, yeah. I, I'd probably want, you know, like, okay I realize most people are not cool with slapping their implants around mm -hmm. but yeah. Nearly every magnet triggered, so you have a finger magnet and you can turn it on. Yeah. yeah. I'm a little bit. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is my fundamental response to pretty much anything anyone develops in the community. Not like, oh well, the philosophical implications are very grand. I'm just like, man, that's cool. <laughs> you should do that some more. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I kind of feel like I haven't really said much over this entire talk, other than like, yeah, scalpel is awesome. <laughs> But I, I mean, if anyone has any actual like technical questions, you should probably get them to Michael instead of me. Michael or Marlo, yeah. Yeah, or Marlo, yeah. I just wanted, you know, it was sort of hard to not take the bait when you're all talking about power stuff, but it's your talk, not mine, but... He's a battery nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be your dog. <laughs> Wait, what do you got one back you're really cool and interesting, and you've been very informative. Don't uh, put yourself down because you don't know a bunch of STEM shit. Oh, thank you. And your lipstick looks dope. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's pretty really sweet. I have all the self esteem of an average banana slug, so I, I don't tend to think these things myself. But it's a very impo important lesson that you could just use piercing tech instead of scalpels to install small devices. Yeah, like most people think, like, oh, well, if it's any kind of surgery, like, it's got to be done with scalpels and it's going to need stitches and, like, like, good oh boy, I should tell you, um, stitches, more difficult than you think. You know, I thought, like, oh, cool, like, well, I'll make a bunch of cuts along the leg and that, like, Got a load of life came, and I'll just practice sewing them up. Only I didn't have a medical needle, I didn't have any medical sutures. What I have was fishing line and a sewing needle. <laughs> <laughs> well, like fishing line's just as good, right? It's oh, pretty enough. strong. I'll hold your flesh together for good enough. Like, and a sewing needle's just as good as a regular needle. Um, actually, no. What happened was I got about like two centimeters into sewing the wound up, and flesh is much harder to get a needle through than like fabric. <laughs> Even though you, like I sew pretty good, but not on my leg. <laughs> and uh, at this point, the sewing needle broke into several pieces, and I had to make a massive T incision to dig out all the bits of sewing needle and shit. So like, steri strips all the way, my friend. <laughs> Some things maybe it would help to get some like official, actual proper training for. <laughs> but I guess the whole point of cyberpunk is that it's like none of us are completely trained anyway. You know what the next thing is you're gonna get? Yes, I do. Um, 
I've been trying to do this by myself for about 10 years. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of crossover between what they call haptics, which are wearables that you don't have to constantly check. They like tell you what, what the data is coming in, and implantable stuff. There is a haptic device that was invented in about 2006 called a North Pole, and it's like a, a you wear it around your ankle. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I just feel like I don't need to point at the ankle for you to know. That. <laughs> <laughs> but you wear it around your ankle, and it's got a ring of like motors and a little compass guy and it, compass module, and it tells you like a, whichever one is constantly closest to magnetic north, I'll make that buzzer buzz. And ever since those were invented, I, I emailed the dude and I was like, man, I really want to make an implanted version of this. And like, shit, I've been trying for 10 years. I, I've been like fusing motors and blowing up batteries and fusing components to each other and busting things because they use the wrong voltage and like, like soldering stuff together like a five-year-old child would and, and, and just all kinds of stupid shit. And eventually I got to Grindfest and these geniuses are all like, yeah, man, that would be like a five-day project, no problem. Like, you know, I could think of a parts list right now. Like, yeah, you do this, 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 and this, and then we could just use that, and it would be really simple. And, like, I've, I've been thinking, you know what, I had a few prototypes, and I was using electrodes instead of buzzers. But the problem with the electrodes is that after a while, they, like, cook all the tissue around them. And I was just sort of putting up with that. And these guys were like, no, you can just use, like, little piezo motors thing like Oh, okay, that's probably better than what I've been doing. So that's what I'm going to be doing next, is this little direction finding guy. And, and even the, the problem with the, the North Pole, I've been calling the South Pole because I'm left-handed, but the, the problem with the North Pole is that it only works on like a vertical plane. Like as soon as you have your ankle at a, other than like, you know, like that to the ground, it, it doesn't really work because the circuitry is not complex enough. It's like a super old school giant PCB. And, the power's not great either because it works off six, six AAA batteries and it drains them in about two days. So like you go through a lot of batteries and it's not super handy to constantly be having this thing. And like I have had a few prototypes and you're like, well, like that was really cool while it was working, but most of my stuff, like I couldn't figure out how to power it properly with the inductive stuff, so it had a battery pack. The battery pack's got to be outside, the rest has got to be inside, so there's wires that go through your skin. And it turns out that like anything that goes through your skin, no matter how well you take care of it, no matter how carefully you clean stuff, there's a limited lifespan because your body hates that and it'll just reject it. But like, like these guys totally have like actual smart ideas. And so like that, I'm really hoping that within the next, I don't know, maybe a year or so, you know, I can actually get like a, like a working version of that, and then maybe I can know where the hell I'm going on Google Maps. <laughs> does, does anyone else? In that case, thank you for having me. <laughs>